continuing Isaac Luria and his school from Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism by Gershom G. Sholem. Between the world of Absolute and that of Uriah, and similarly between each of the following ones, he postulates a curtain, our partition wall, which has a double effect. In the first place, it causes the divine substance itself to flow upwards. The light of Ein Sof is refracted. Secondly, the power which emanates from the substance, if not, the latter itself passes through the filter of the curtain. This power then becomes the substance of the next world, of which, again, only the power passes into the third, and so through all four s spheres. Not Ein Sof itself is dispersed in the nether worlds, but only a radiance, differing from his substance. Havra, which emanates from him in this fashion, that element of the nether worlds, which, as it were, envelops and hides the Parksufim in them, assumes the character of a creature in a stricter sense. These garments of the divinity are no longer substantially one with God. It is true that there is no lack of speculative discursions in entirely different connections, which are calculated to throw doubt on the definiteness of this solution, and which have, in fact, encouraged various pantheistic reinterpretations of the Lurianic system. More radical theists, like Moses Hayim Zato, have tried to guard against this danger by not denying altogether the continuity of the process in the four worlds and assuming that Godhead, after manifesting itself in all glory in the world of Atzaloth, proceeded to bring forth the three other worlds by an act of creation out of nothing, no longer conceived of as a mere metaphor. Others have gone further and presumed that even the ray from Ein Sof, whose incursion into the primordial space forms the starting point of all the processes after the Tsim Tsum was not of the same substance as Ein Sof, but was created ex nihilo. All these interpretations must, however, be regarded as deviations from Luria's authentic teachings. 7. This brings us to a further aspect of the doctrine of Takun, which is also the more important for the system of practical theosophy, the process in which God conceives, brings forth, and develops himself, does not reach its final conclusion in God. Certain parts of the process of restitution are allotted to man. Not all the lights which are held in captivity by the powers of darkness are set free by their own efforts. It is man who adds the final touch to the divine countenance. It is he who completes the enthronement of God, the king, and the mystical creator of all things, in his own kingdom of heaven. It is he who perfects the maker of all things. In certain spheres of being, divine and human existence are intertwined. The intrinsic, extra-mundane processes of Takun, symbolically described as the birth of God's personality, corresponds to the process of mundane history. The historical process and its innermost soul, the religious act of the Jew prepared for the way of the final restitution of all the scattered and exiled lights and sparks, the Jew who was in close contact with the divine life through the Torah, the fulfillment of the commandments, and through prayer, has in it his power to accelerate or to hinder the processes. Every act of man is related to this final text, this final task which God has set for his creatures. It follows from this that for Luria, the appearance of the Messiah is nothing but the consummation of the continuous process of the restoration of Tikkun. The true nature of redemption is therefore mystical, and its historical and national aspects are merely ancillary symptoms, which constitute a visible symbol of its consummation. The redemption of Israel concludes the redemption of all things, for does not redemption mean that everything is put in its proper place?
that the original blemish is removed. The world of Takun is therefore the world of the messianic action. The coming of the Messiah means that this world of Takun has received its final shape. It is here that we have the point where the mystical and the messianic element in Luria's doctrine are welded together. The Takun, the path to the end of all things, is also the path of the beginning. Theosophic cosmology, the doctrine of the emergence of all things from God, becomes its opposite, the doctrine of salvation. As the return of all things to their original contact with God, everything that man does reacts somewhere and somehow on this complicated process of Takun. Every event and every domain of existence faces at once, inwardly and outwardly, which is why Luria declares that worlds and all their externals are dependent on acts of religion, on the fulfillment of the commandments and meritorious deeds. But according to him, everything internal in these worlds depends on spiritual actions, of which the most important is prayer. In a sense, therefore, we are not only masters of our own destiny, and in the last resort are ourselves responsible for the continuation of the Galuth, but we also fulfill a mission which reaches far beyond that. In a previous lecture, I mentioned the magic of inwardness connected with certain Kabbalistic doctrines in Lurianic thought. These elements, under the name of Kawana, our mystical intention, occupy a highly important position. The task of man is seen to consist in the direction of his whole inner purpose towards the restoration of the original harmony, which was disturbed by the original defect. The breaking of the vessels and those powers of evil and sin, which date from that time, to unify the name of God, as the term goes, is not merely to perform an act of confession and acknowledgement of God's kingdom. It is more than that. It is an action rather than an act. The tacoon restores the unity of God's name, which was destroyed by the original defect. Luria speaks of the letters J-H, well, Yah, as being torn away from Wah in the name Yahweh. And every true religious act is directed toward the same aim. Well, the yud in the front of hua is, um, you know, something comes in, right? So the people saying it backwards and all that other stuff, it, does, it doesn't work in Semitic languages like it may work in other languages, but because uh, it's basically the same thing. Um, God is a noun and verb that remains in saying the name backwards, but that's that's a whole different point. But establishing established um, sort of what you come across with the Tetragrammaton in Aramea, Hebrew, I guess, too. In an age in which the historical exile of the people was a terrible and fundamental reality of life, the old idea of an exile of the Shekinah gained a far greater importance than ever before. For all the persistent claim that this idea represents a mere metaphor, it is clear from their own writings that the Kabbalist at bottom saw something else in it. The exile of the Shekinah is not a metaphor. It is a genuine symbol of the broken state of things in the realm of divine potentialities. The Shekinah fell as the last Sephira when the vessels were broken. When the Takun began and the last Sephiroth was reorganized as Rachel, the celestial bride, she gathered fresh force and had all but achieved complete unification with the Zyre Enpin when, through an act described as the lessening of the moon, she was for the second time deprived of some of her substance. Again, with the creation of the earthly Adam, the Takun was, strictly speaking, at an end. The worlds were almost in the state for which they had been prepared, and if Adam had not fallen into sin on the sixth day, the final redemption would have been brought about on the Sabbath by his prayers and spiritual actions. The eternal Sabbath would have come, and everything would have returned to its original root. Instead, Adam's fall again destroyed the harmony and hurled all the worlds from the pedestals, and again sent the Shekinah into exile. To lead the Shekinah back to her master, to unite her with him, is in one way or another the true purpose of the Torah. It is this mystical function of human action which lends it to a special dignity. 
the fulfillment of each and every commandment was to be accompanied by a formula declaring that this was done for the sake of uniting the Holy One, praise be He, and as Shekinah, out of fear and love. But the doctrine of Kawana, particularly of the Kawana of prayer, does not stop there. Teluria, the heir of a whole school of thought and classical capitalism, which he merely developed further. Prayer means more than a free outpouring of religious feeling, nor is it merely the institutionalized acknowledgement and praise of God as creator and king by the religious community in the standard prayers of Jewish liturgy, the individual's prayers as well as those of the community, but particularly the latter, are under certain conditions as the vehicle of the soul's mystical ascent to God. The words of prayer, more particularly of the traditional liturgical prayer with its fixed text, became a silken cord with the aid of which the mystical intention of the mind gropes its dangerous way through the darkness towards God. The purpose of mystical meditation in the act of prayer and in reflecting upon this act is to discover the various stages of this ascent, which of course can also be called a descent into the deepest recesses of the soul. Prayer, according to Luria, is a symbolical image of the theogonic and cosmic process. The devout worshiper who prays in a spirit of mystical meditation moves through all the stages of this process, from the outermost to the innermost. More than that, prayer is a mystical action which has an influence on the spheres through which the mystic moves in his kawana. It is part of the great mystical process of Takun, since kawana is of a spiritual nature. It can achieve something in the spiritual world. It can become the most powerful factor. If used by the right man in the right place, as we have seen the process of restoring all things to the proper place demands not only an impulse from God, but also one from his creature in its religious action. True life and true amends for original sin are made possible by the confluence and the concurrence of both impulses, the divine and the human. The true worshiper, in short, exercises a tremendous power over the inner worlds, just as he bears a correspondingly great responsibility for the fulfillment of his messianic tasks. The life of every world and every sphere is in continuous movement. Every moment is a new stage in its development. At every moment it strives to find the natural form which will lift it out of the confusion, and therefore there is in the last resort a new kawana for every new moment. Not, um, No mystical prayer is complete like any other. True prayer is modeled on the rhythm of the hour for which and in which it speaks. Since everyone makes his individual contribution to the task of tikkun in accordance with the particular rank of his soul in the hierarchy, all mystical meditation is of an individual nature. As for the general principles concerning the direction of such meditation, the principles which everyone may apply in his own way and in his own time to the, spirit, uh, to the standard prayers of the liturgy. Luria believed he had found them and his followers developed them in great detail. They represent an application of Abilafia's theory of meditation to the new Kabbalah, the emphasis on the strictly individual character of prayer, which occupies an important place in Hayam Vathal's theory of Kawana, is all the more important because we are all here in a region of mysticism where the danger of degeneration into mechanical magic and theurgy is greatest. Luria's doctrine a mystical prayer stands directly on the borderline between mysticism and magic, where the one only too easily passes into the other. Every prayer which is more than mere acknowledgment of God's kingdom, indeed every prayer which in a more or less clearly defined sense is bound up with the hope of its being granted, involves the eternal paradox a man's hope to influence the inscrutable ways and eternal decisions of providence. This paradox in the unfathomable depths of which religious feeling has its abode leads inevitably to the question of the magical nature of prayer. Now, some words of prayer imply that as much as one's doing these things willingly, 
that one's doing them according to a certain pattern and whatnot that is not one's own. Like in Semitic languages, we have word salah, and universal to this, including in tonic, you uh, recite scripture. Now, not all scripture sounds like it's, I mean, especially when you're referring to the stuff in the, uh, in the Bible, not all scripture sounds like it's um, what people would call a prayer, but it is. I mean, there's certain prayer directions and certain gestures like bowing and prostrating that are universal to this stuff too, and folding the arms right over left in reverence. Um, another mushroom, got to be careful of these. I don't know what they are. Um, the the facile distinction. Uh, the facile distinction between magic and so-called true mysticism, which we find in the writings of some modern scholars and which we have also met in Abilafia's account of his own system, with their abstract definitions of the term mysticism, is quite irrelevant to the history and to the lives of many mystical thinkers. Granted that magic and mysticism represent fundamentally different categories, that does not disprove the fact that they are capable of meeting, developing, and interacting in the same mind. History shows that particularly those schools of mysticism which are not purely pantheistic and show no tendency to blur the distinction between God and nature represent a blend of the mystical and the magical consciousness. That is true of many forms of Indian, Greek, Catholic, and also of Jewish mysticism. That the doctrine of Kawana in prayer was capable of being interpreted as a certain kind of magic seems clear to me that it involves the problem of magical practices is beyond any doubt. Yet, the number of Kabbalists who weakened under the temptation is surprisingly small. I have had occasion in Jerusalem to meet men who to this day adhere to the practice of mystical meditation in prayer, as Luria taught it. For among the 80,000 Jews of Jerusalem, there are still 30 or 40 masters of mystical prayer who practice it after years of spiritual training. I am bound to say, in the majority of cases, a glance is sufficient to recognize the mystical character of their devotion. None of these men would deny that the inner kawana of prayer is easily capable of being externalized as magic, but they have evolved, or perhaps one should say inherited a system of spiritual education in which the center of gravity lies on mystical introspection. The kawana is to them also the way to Devakuth, that mystical contact with God, which, as we have seen in a previous lecture, is the typical form of unio mystica in capitalism. Ecstasy is possible here only within the limits imposed by this kawana. It is an ecstasy of silent meditation, of a descent of the human will to meet that of God, prayer serving as a kind of balustrade on which the mystic leans, so as not to be plunged suddenly or unprepared into an ecstasy in which the holy waters might drown his consciousness. Uh, eight. The doctrine and practice of mystical prayer is the esoteric part of Lurianic Kabbalism, that part of it which is reserved to the elect side by side with this doctrine. However, we find ideas of a different character. Above all, the doctrine of practical realization of the tikkun and its combination not only with the aforementioned view of the devotee's task, but also with the doctrine of metempsychosis secured to all three elements, the strongest influence on wide circles of Jewry. The task of man has been defined by Luria in a simple but effective way as the restoration of his primordial spiritual structure, our gestalt, that is the task of every one of us, for every soul contains the potentialities of this spiritual appearance, outraged and de degraded by the fall of Adam, whose soul contained all souls. From this soul of all souls, Sparks have scattered in all directions and become fused into matter. The problem is to, resemble, uh, to reassemble them, to lift them to their proper place, and to restore the spiritual nature of man in its original splendor as God conceived it. According to Luria, the meaning of the acts in which Torah prescribes or forbids is none other than the exclusion 
by and in the individual of this process of restitution of man's spiritual nature, the Targum already drew a parallel between the 613 commandments and prohibitions of the Torah and supposed 613 parts of the human body. Now Luria advances the thought that the soul which represented the original appearance of man before its exile into the body has also 613 parts. By fulfilling the commandments of the Torah, man restores his own spiritual structure. He carves it out of himself, as it were, and since every part, part corresponds to a commandment, the solution of the task demands the complete fulfillment of all the th 613 commandments. Incidentally, this interrelation of all man, uh, of all men, you know, as in humans, through Adam's soul, has already moved Cordovero to mystical speculations. To quote his words, in every one there is something of his fellow man. Therefore, whoever sins injures not only himself, but also that part of himself which belongs to another. And this, according to Cordovero, is the true reason why the Torah, Leviticus 19.18, could prescribe the commandment, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, for the other is really he himself. Well, we refer to the external through ourselves, at the very least. At this point, I should like to insert a remark. The Gnostical character of this psychology and anthropology is evident. The structure of Luria's anthropology corresponds on the whole to that of his theology and cosmology, with the difference that the point of reference is no longer the mystical light of the divine emanation and manifestation, but the soul and its sparks. Man, as he was before his fall, is conceived as a cosmic being which contains the whole world in itself and whose station is superior to, even to that of Metatron, the first of the angels. Adam Harashan, the Adam of the Bible, corresponds to the anthropological plane, to Adam Kadman, the ontological primary man. Evidently, the human and mystical man are closely related to each other. Their structure is the same, and to use Vital's own words, the one is the clothing and the veil of the other. Here we have also the explanation for the connection between man's fall and the cosmic process, between morality and physics. Since Adam was truly, and not merely metaphorically, all-embracing, his fall was bound likewise to drag down and affect everything, not merely metaphorically, but really. The drama of Adam Kadman on the theosophical plane is repeated and paralleled by that of Adam Rashan, the universe falls, Adam falls, everything is affected and disturbed and enters into a stage of diminution, as Luria calls it. Original sin repeats the breaking of the vessels on a correspondingly lower plane. The effect is, again, that nothing remained. Were it should be, and as it should be, nothing, therefore, was from then on its proper place. Everything is an exile. The spiritual light of the Shekinah was dragged down into the darkness of the demonic world of evil. The result is the mixture of good and evil, which must be dissolved by restoring the element of light to its former position, Adam was a spiritual being whose place was in the world of Asiya, which, as we have seen, was also a spiritual realm. When he fell into sin, then and then only did this world, too, fall from its former place and thereby become mixed up with the realm of the Klippoth, which originally was placed below it. Thus, there came into being the material world in which we live, and the existence of man as a part spiritual, part material being, and whenever we fall into sin, we cause a repetition of this process of the confusion of the holy with the unclean, the fall of the Shekinah and her exile. Sparks of the Shekinah are scattered in all worlds, and there is no sphere of existence, including organic and inorganic nature, that is not full of holy sparks, which are mixed up with the Klepoth and need to be separated from them and lifted up the student of religious history, the close affinity of these thoughts to the religious ideas of the Manichaeans must be obvious at once. We have here certain Gnostic elements, especially the theory of the scattered sparks or particles of light, 
which were either absent from or played no particular part in early papalistic thought. At, as at the same time, there can be no doubt that this fact is due not to historical connections between the Manichaeans and the new Kabbalah of Safed, but to a profound similarity in outlook and disposition, which in its development produced similar results. In spite of this fact, or perhaps rather because of it, students of Gnosticism may have something to learn from the Lurianic system, which, in my opinion, is a perfect example of Gnostical thought, both in principle and in detail. But let us go back to where we start started, you know, to start part nine. I mean, we're starting part nine. Uh, the fulfillment of man's task in this world is connected by Luria as well as by all the other Sethid Epilists with the doctrine of metempsychosis, our transmigration of the soul. In the latter development of the school of Safed, this remarkable doctrine has been elaborated in great detail in Hayim Vital's Sefer Ha Gilgulim, our book of transmigrations, in which he gave a systematic description of Luria's doctrine of metempsychosis as the final product of a long and important development in Kabbalistic thought. I do not intend to pursue this point further than to remark that there is a considerable difference between the respective attitudes of the older and the newer school of capitalism towards this idea, which, as I said, found its classic expression in Luria's and Vital's doctrine as for the motives which prompted both the old and the new Kabbalah to embrace the doctrine of transmigration. They were probably not different at first from those which have always encouraged belief in it, i.e. the impression made upon sensitive minds by the sufferings of innocent children the contentedness of the wicked and other phenomena which demand a natural explanation in order to conform with the belief in divine justice within the sphere of nature, for it must be admitted that the solution of these apparent contradictions by the conception of divine retribution and in general by eschatological hopes has at all times failed to satisfy. Had to make sure a tree wasn't going to fall. Uh, the mind of many believers in religion, the difference is that the majority of older Kabbalists believed in Gilgul, to use the Hebrew term for transmigration. And it doesn't entirely mean that in Aramea, but it became the term for reincarnation by people. Well, it's not reincarnation, it's transmigration. What, what, whatever, uh, different, di uh, different doctrines are placed upon people who believe in either of those only in connection with certain defenses chiefly sexual as i have pointed out in the previous lecture they knew nothing of a universal law of transmigration considered as a system of moral causality that is to say a system of moral causes and physical effects karma to use the sanskrit term it fits into this picture that the whole doctrine which at first seems to have encountered much opposition was regarded as a particularly occult mystery and gained no entrance into wider circles. A 13th century mystic like Isaac Ibn Latif rejected it disdainfully. 16th century Kabbalism took a different view. For meanwhile, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, the doctrine of Gilgul had come to express in a new and forcible way the reality of exile. Its function was, as it were, to lift the experience of the Jew in the Galuf, the exile and migration of the body to the higher plane of a symbol for the exile of the soul. Now, G Galuth, you know, that's related to Goliath. So, um, again, in Hebrew, we're getting new meanings for things that maybe in Aramea, you know, the language of Tonic and the early uh, Jewish writings, aside from that, just, you know, didn't have. Um, the inner exile, too, owes its existence to the fall. If Adam contained the entire soul of humanity, which is now diffused among the whole genius in innumerable codifications and individual appearances, all transmigrations of souls are, in the last resort, only migrations of the one soul whose exile atones for its fall. In addition, every individual provides, by his behavior, countless occasions for ever-renewed exile, Altogether, we have here a fairly comprehensive conception of the Gilgul as a law of the universe, and the idea of retribution by punishment in hell is pushed rather far into the background. Obviously, a radical theory of retribution in the process of transmigration leaves no room at all for the conception of hell, 
and it is not surprising to find that there have indeed been attempts to allegorize the idea of hell so much as to deprive it of its literal meaning. In general, however, we find a mixture of both ideas, and the Safed school in particular was inclined to allot a certain place in its scheme of trans transmigratory stages into the old-fashioned hell. The two ideas intertwine, but the emphasis is undoubtedly on transmigration. This doctrine now becomes closely involved with the conception of man's role in the universe. Each individual soul retains its individual existence only until the moment when it has worked out its own spiritual restoration. Souls which have fulfilled the commandment B, they those of all humanity, of the sons of Noah, are in the case of the Jews, the 613 of the Torah. I would venture to say that at least a couple of them aren't. I can think of examples, but... Uh, are exempted from the law of transmigration and await each in its blessed place, their integration into Adam's soul, when the general restitution of all things shall take place. As long as the soul has not fulfilled this tax, it remains subject to the law of transmigration. Transmigration is thus no longer mere retribution. It is also the same, at the same time a chance of fulfilling the commandments which it was not given to the soul 